Well, good morning, Cornerstone, and welcome to worship. It's great to be with you. Some of you are joining us from your couch or your home right here in Dallas. Some of you are joining us from the beach or from the mountains. We wanna see where you're worshiping with us from. So will you take a picture of yourself wherever you are in the world and tag us on social media at HPUMC? I don't know about you, but for me, this has been a rough couple of months. There's a lot of chaos and uncertainty. I'm not even sure if I'm still allowed to go to the grocery store or restaurants, and some of you are living large, but I found that in the last few weeks especially, there are so many opportunities for conflict. Conflict can be hard, it can also be a tool for growth. That's why this week on the podcast on Let Me In, I interviewed two therapists, Josh and Jen Hook, to talk about how conflict can help deepen and not destroy your relationships. I hope you join me in that conversation. One of the things that's also been hard about this pressure cooker season is battling addiction. As a church, we want to support you if you or somebody you love is in recovery and trying hard to do that uphill battle towards staying sober and healthy. If that's you or if this is resonating with you in any way, you can visit hpumc.org recovery. And the best next step to take is to reach out to our recovery coordinator, Jenny Mislin. She's a good friend of mine and she has a ton of tools to help you take the next step from wherever you are in your road to recovery. I don't know what your week has been like or what the week ahead holds, but I do know that something happens when we pause and when we anchor ourselves in the reality that God is still sitting on his throne. So that's what we're gonna do for the next hour. We're gonna press pause. We're gonna dig our roots deep into worship. We're gonna sing, we're gonna pray, we're gonna hear a great message. And then we'll send you back out into the world to live with confidence and hope that God is good. So will you pray with me and then we'll sing together. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Lord, as a church, we're reading about your work and your movement through the book of Acts. And we trust that you're still working. Lord, that you're all around us, that you're working in us and through us. Would you wake us up to your presence in our lives? God, in this next hour that we give to you, we give you our attention. We give you our eyes and our ears. We ask that you would speak to us and stir us up so that we might leave this space a little more like your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, let's worship, church. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. Since when has it possible we ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has it possible to ever stop to you? This is the sound of the dry bones rattling.
What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we love your name. Your name is holy. Your name is worthy. And we're so grateful for the power that is in your name. God, because of your name, we can find strength. Because of your name, we can find healing. So, Lord, we just thank you for being the Lord of all. We thank you for being our God in this season. We thank you, God, that every question, every concern that we have, every answer is found in you. So, Lord, we trust in you. We lean not to our own understanding. God, we thank you that you are our provider. God, we thank you that you are the one constant true thing that we have had, that we have in our life. So, Lord, we repent, God, for trusting in our own understanding, for leaning to our own thoughts and leaning to our own reasoning. And, God, we surrender and we cast every care to you, creating us clean hearts, God, creating us clean minds. Wash us pure, God, so that we can live holy, pure, and sanctified for you, God. So, Father, now we'll pray the prayer that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, good morning, Cornerstone. All right, I've got a question for you to get us kicked off this morning. Who are the voices that you're spending the most time listening to right now? Just take a second to think about that. Who are the voices that have the most influence in your life? Uh, during this time that we're in. Another way to think about that is, who are you giving authority? Because here's the deal. And we're navigating a lot of stuff right now. I mean, we're still in the midst of a pandemic that we're not exactly sure how to deal with. Uh, We are talking about race in a more robust way than we have in half a century. And by the way, in four and a half months, we have a presidential election, which in any normal year, if it wasn't 2020, that is all that we would be talking about. We have big things in our society right now, and all of us are expected to have an opinion on them. You probably have an opinion on these things. Who is, help influence, who is helping to influence your opinion? I mean, who is helping to inform you? Who are the voices that you're spending the most time listening to? Because I'm going to go ahead and share right off the bat a concern with you, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in, but I'm going to go ahead and share my concern with you. My concern is for our our society as a whole, but in particular for our Christians, okay? In particular for for those of us in the church. I'm concerned that we end up doing one of two things. I'm concerned that we end up uh, becoming either turtles or parrots, okay? We become turtles. We just kind of sneak back into our shell with our own thoughts, and then we let other thoughts in that we are pretty sure are going to agree with us, okay? Okay? Our society, and and look, this is about the right and the left here, okay? Look, in our society, we are notorious for our echo chambers. And we can do this because we only allow news in that we're pretty sure is going to confirm what we already believe. We only listen to podcasts or read blog posts that we're pretty sure is going to confirm what we we already believe. I'm concerned that some of us are becoming turtles and we just kind of close up and we only listen to the things that we we already know we're going to agree with and that we believe. Those are the voices that we let in, okay? But I'll tell you, I am equally as concerned about the other side. We talk a lot about this side. It's well known that that's a problem. I am equally as concerned about the other side. And that is that instead of becoming turtles, we become parrots. And we just repeat whatever it is that we hear. And of course, today, what it looks like to repeat is it looks like to retweet and it looks like to repost. And we just, without, it seems, any kind of critical thinking, we just take what other people are saying and we throw it out there ourselves. Let me tell you, if uh, we do that, I don't know about you, I'm not going to put this on you. If I were to do that, here's what would happen. 
I would both talk about race all the time and I would never talk about race again if I just did what everybody told me uh, to do. I, I would both wear a mask everywhere and throw that face diaper in the trash can, right? If I was listening to what everybody told me uh, to do. We end up having the same problem when we're parrots, and that is that we only parrot the same issue with the turtles. We only parrot the voices that we already agree with. But I, I'm concerned about the turtles, okay? But I'm concerned about those of us that are becoming parrots too. They just repeat uncritically whatever it is that we hear. I've seen a few people post stuff online. They just say, I, do you actually believe that? Do you, do you really agree with that? Or are you just putting that out there? Like, I know this is a hard way to start, but look, look, we, 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 we got to be mature, grown-up uh, believers, okay? Hey, I am worried about us being turtles, and I'm worried about us being parrots. So this morning, I want um, to push us towards a couple of different things. And, and really not me, I think the scripture is pushing us towards a couple of different things. It's pushing us towards being um, followers of Jesus who are intentional about thinking more critically, okay? Who, who are intentional about really thinking through what we believe, why we believe it, and what then we should do. And thinking critically, but of course also, and we talk about this a lot, but loving generously. Thinking critically, loving generously. We talk a lot about loving generously. So today I really want to hone in on how can we be men and women that are thinking critically. I'm not going to tell you who to listen to, but instead I'm going to open up the scripture and it's going to talk to us about not who to listen to, but how to decide who to listen to. If you're somebody who thinks that the scripture is just a bunch of old stories that don't matter, this is going to fly in the face of that assumption. So I'm going to pray for us and we're going to jump in. Let's pray. God, thanks for this time that we have together. I pray that you, by the power of your spirit, will be with us. Guide this conversation. Lord, the scripture, it, it's, they we're just looking at seven verses, but it is moving, it is alive, and it can speak to us today, and I pray that we'll all experience that. So take the words that I prepared, bring them to life. Give us all um, uh, just ears to, to be able to hear and to process, and help us be sensitive to how your spirit's moving. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing to you, O Lord. You're our rock and our redeemer. We pray these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I'm going to tell you a kind of embarrassing story about my life. Then I'm going to tell you a story out of the scripture, and that's going to pull out some really practical stuff. Okay, so in the fall of 2000, uh, 2000 the fall of 2000, I threw a fork at my little brother. Okay, It wasn't my proudest moment, but you may be asking, why did you throw a fork at your little brother? Well, the answer to that question is really easy. I threw a fork at my little brother because I'd missed him with a spoon, and I didn't want to throw the knife. Okay, that's why I threw the fork. Okay. Harder question, why did I throw the spoon at my little brother? Well, I threw the spoon at my little brother because he called me out on something. And there is nothing worse than being called out by your little brother. He called me out on something. We were talking about the presidential election. There were other people in the room. I don't remember who else was there. I just know that he was over in the kitchen. I was at the table uh, with uh, silverware in front of me. Okay, And uh, he said, well, I know who Matt's going to vote for. Matt's going to vote for whoever Eddie Vedder tells him to vote for. Eddie Vedder, for those of you who don't know, is the lead singer of Pearl Jam, my favorite band. Um, and I, I was infuriated when Brad said that. And the reason that I was infuriated was because he was right. And, and I knew it. And I'm sure that I stumbled around and tried to explain, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. The number one voice in my life helping me to determine who I would cast my vote for, my first vote ever in a presidential election, by the way, the leading voice in my life was a rock star. And if I'm going to be honest, the second leading voice was probably Lauren Michaels in the Saturday Night Live cast. That is who was determining who I voted for. I mean, forget doing any kind of critical thinking, any kind of research into the issues or into to who I felt was best fit to lead our country. Forget any of that. Brad was right. I was going to vote for who Eddie Vedder told me to vote for. Now, this is a little bit awkward because um, in the 2000 presidential election, one of the candidates is a member of our church. And uh, Mr. President, if uh, you're watching, if this makes its way to you, I, I, just, I just have to say um, what you probably already know, 
And that is that your base of support wasn't really the grunge rock community in 2000. Like, that's just, that's just the way that it was. And I was listening to, I was listening to Eddie at the time. And he, here, here's the thing. Eddie Vedder is someone that actually I've learned a whole lot from. I've learned a whole lot from. Listening to one of uh, Pearl Jam's songs on the tape cassette, their second album, I'll never forget listening to this one particular song laying on my grandmother's floor in Monticello, Georgia, and it opening my eyes to issues of race for, the, for, the, for the, maybe the first time, or at least in a new way, and helping me to understand the power of music. I will never forget that. He's not a voice that I think shouldn't be in any of our lives, but he's not the leading voice that I need to have when I'm trying to determine probably anything but certainly when it comes to politics. So for you, who are you listening to? Is it a rock star or a celebrity? Is it somebody who is funded by the 24-hour news cycle to, to put out uh, news, this, this kind of entertainment stuff? Is, it, is, 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 is that who it is? Who is it that, that's, that, that, that you are giving authority in your life to help you decide what you believe, and what you should do with what you believe. Okay, like I said, I'm not going to try to correct who we are and who we aren't listening to. I'm not using names this morning, but I am going to talk about how it is that we can determine that. And to get after that, we're going to be in Acts today, okay? Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 6. So you can go ahead and turn to that with me. As you're turning, let me remind you that what we're doing as a church is we're reading through Acts. We're actually halfway through it uh, right now, just a little over halfway. So we're picking back up on Monday morning with chapter 16. If you missed the first half, don't let that be a reason you missed the second half. hbmc.org slash Bible. We're gonna get you all the information that you need uh, to know right there. So this is something that we read a couple of weeks ago and I reflected on it in the morning Bible study uh, that I do. So it'll be a recap for some of you that are doing that, but we're gonna go a little bit deeper and it also it'll be new for most of you. Okay, Acts chapter six. As I read through this, be thinking, what does this have to do with how we determine what voices we give influence in our lives. Okay, all right, verse one. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, so when is this happening? It's happening in a time where the church is growing gangbusters, okay? Where the church is, uh, is increasing. And as we've seen earlier in Acts, there's a lot of unity, okay? Everybody is united around the resurrected uh, Jesus, around loving God, around loving other people, a lot of that. But as often occurs... The unity is threatened because a complaint by the Hellenist arose against the Hebrews. Okay, just think about our culture real quick. And this uh, here will make you see that, that this isn't just about American culture. It's about just human culture uh, in general. Think about what happened the year after uh, the 2000 election. Think about September 11th and how we were all united for like a day and a half or maybe a little bit longer than that. And then you get deep disagreements about how it is that we respond to this. We all agree that what happened was wrong, that it, that it, that it was evil, that, um, that it needed to be confronted. But there were different opinions about how to confront it. Think about coronavirus. I mean, we were united for longer around the fight against coronavirus than we were after September 11th. I mean, there were four or five weeks there where we were just all kind of t together in this. But now you get disagreements. Think about this race stuff all united in just um, disgust over the killing of George Floyd. You can't watch the video and, and not, not deeply grieve, not just his death, but, but just in, in justice in general. You, you can't watch that and not be deeply uh, torn by it. But there are deep disagreements about how do we now move forward um, with racial reconciliation and, and, and all of those things. This is just the way that human beings seem to work. When something happens, we come together, and then there are divisions. The church has always had to watch this. So the division is between the Hellenist and the Hebrews. Okay, who in the world are these people? Well, the Hebrews are uh, uh, Aramaic-speaking Jews who likely grew up in Israel and have just deep-seated Jewish customs. So these are uh, Aramaic-speaking Jews that have become Christians. Who were the Hellenists? These are Greek-speaking Jews. Okay, these distinctions aren't super important, but, but they're interesting and they help us just a little bit. These are Greek-speaking Jews that likely grew up outside of Israel 
And because they grew up outside of Israel, they also have other customs from the countries that they came in. So they're united in their Judaism, and they're now united in their, their Christianity, in their belief that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. But they are divided by their language, and they're divided by some cultural uh, differences. So the Greek speakers have a complaint against the Aramaic speakers because the Greek speakers' widows were being neglected by the daily distributions. So widows doesn't necessarily mean that, that your husband died. It could mean that your husband left you. Widows in this culture are very, very vulnerable. Uh, if you didn't have a family member to take you in, you probably became a beggar. You became a prostitute. Very, very vulnerable. Early Christians recognize we got to care for this population, this group of people. So they have daily distributions. They care for them. But the Greeks begin to recognize we're not being treated the same as the Aramaic speakers. So they make a complaint. The 12, these are the disciples, the apostles. They summoned the full number of the disciples, everybody. And they said, look, here's the deal. It's th th this part that I'm about to say first is implied here. This is a problem. We know they think it's a problem because they actually deal with it. This is a problem. But here's the thing. It's not right that we, that the 12 of us, should give up preaching the word of God in order to, to serve these tables. We have a unique role here in the church. We're the ones that knew Jesus. We're the ones that can teach with authority what he said. We need to be out there teaching and preaching. We can't be the ones to fix this problem. So, brothers and sisters, pick out from among yourselves seven men who are of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. So we can't do it. It's a problem, though. We got to fix it. We're going to pick seven people. We're going to lift seven people up to deal with us. What they said was pleasing to the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, it's the first one, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, who was a proselyte of, uh, of Antioch, which means he wasn't born a Jew, but he became a Jew. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. So they appoint these seven to lead in this particular area. And then we get back to where we were at the beginning. Do you remember in the beginning? Things are growing. Things are good. We get back there at the end. And the word of the Lord continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. We see this in the scripture. We see this just in human history. Right? There's unity. There's division. And if you aren't intentional and wise about how you deal with the division, then you don't come back together. But if you are intentional and wise, then you actually can come back together. Do you, you, this, this speaks volumes to where we are. But did you pick up on this? Did you pick up on who the seven voices they lift up are? Okay, And this is where this is going to help us to discern who we need to be listening to. You, you notice anything about these seven? Well, the first thing, it's not fair. You, you wouldn't have noticed it. I didn't notice this until I did some research, okay? This isn't fair. The second two you can notice on your own. All seven of these names, you wouldn't know this, okay? All seven of these names, they're all Greek names, okay? They're not Hebrew or Aramaic names. Like, how are you and I supposed to know that, okay? But other people who are smarter than us, they research this and they tell us this. They're all Greek names. They're not Hebrew or Aramaic names, which tells us what? Who does the church lift up? Who are the voices they lift up? Well, they lift up seven people in the community that is being disadvantaged. Do you see that? They lift up seven people who have proximity to the problem. And they lift up and they listen to their voices and they give them leadership. Okay, do you, you, you see that? You see what that has to do with us uh, today? So the voices that you are allowing to speak into your life, do they have proximity to the problem? Are they close to it? Is it something that they, that they know uh, firsthand? Do they have proximity to the problem? Not everybody you listen to has to have proximity, but somebody that you're listening to needs to have proximity. Okay? Okay, but now let's back up. These are the ones that we could have noticed. But then in verse 3. So they, they've all got to be people of good repute. So good reputation. They're, they're good witnesses is what the actual word means there. Well, how do you define that? Well, there are people that are full of the Spirit and full of, do you see this? Wisdom. I got a lot of people in my life that I like, that I enjoy spending time with, but they don't have a whole lot of wisdom to offer on some of these issues that we're really navigating. I tell couples when they come in and they meet with me and they're getting married, you need to go and you need to ask uh, a few people in your life what you need to work on in order to be the best spouse possible. Not generic advice, specific advice. And I always tell them, they've got to be people that know you 
are willing to hurt your feelings and have some kind of wisdom to offer. Because we all have people, particularly friends from college, that know us well and that are willing to hurt our feelings, but they don't have any wisdom uh, to offer. You need to be listening to people, I tell them, who have wisdom when it comes to relationships. Okay, as you're seeking to navigate what you believe and what you think that we should be doing, do the people that are speaking to you have wisdom? And in particular, do they have wisdom about what they are talking about specifically? I mean, here's the thing. One of the things, and this goes back to my story earlier, one of the things that drives me nuts about our culture is that we idealize celebrities. We have this tendency to think that if you're good at one thing, it must mean that you're good at everything. That if you know one thing well, you must know everything. So we take our celebrities and we make them experts in everything from politics to the economy to immunology. And what a burden we are putting on them. And what Fools we are if we think, as a friend of mine said this week, that we should invite Justin Bieber over to give us lawn care advice. I mean, if you want to know how to take care of your lawn, you should listen to your lawn person, not Justin Bieber. Bieber didn't actually do that. It's just a crazy example my friend used, right? Look, but here's the thing. We do this kind of thing all the time. Are we actually listening to people that have wisdom in the subject? Or are we listening to people who happen to have a public platform and who happen to have opinions, but their opinions are no more informed than yours are? Here's another way to put it. The people that you listen to should know more about this subject than you do. And they should know more about this subject than you could figure out in a day's worth of research. Not everybody, but you've got to have some people that you're listening to who have that degree of wisdom. Some people with proximity, some people with wisdom. You may not find one person who has all these things. But here's the last one. God, this, this is the kicker, okay? This is the kicker. Do you see this? People that are full of the Spirit. Okay. Now, I run the risk here of being misquoted, and, 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 and that's okay. I am not at all about to say that we should never listen to non-Christians. I am not at all going to say that non-Christians don't have wisdom to offer here. I'm not saying that at all. But I am going to say clearly and boldly that Christians have a unique perspective with which we see the world. And if we take Jesus seriously, we should be looking at all of the issues of the world through the lens of our Christian faith. In this online Bible study, we talk a lot about how, look, here's the thing. Um, Jesus is not just something that we should build into our lives, but he is something that we can build our lives around. This was like a big moment for me when I became a committed Christian, was recognizing that Christianity wasn't a hobby that I insert in. It's actually something that everything else can be built around. If that's the case, then we need to be looking towards men and women who can help guide us in our understanding of all of these big issues through the lens of their faith and of our faith. So friends, who are you listening to? Are they men and women with proximity, with wisdom, and who are following after Jesus themselves and can help you figure out how to follow after Jesus in the midst of, of, of whatever the, the, the issue is that you're talking about with them. I mean, our, our belief in Jesus leads us to have different beliefs than the rest of the world. We, we have to see this, right? I mean, we, we believe that every single person is someone of sacred worth created in the image of God. Everybody. Not one, not one exception. Our faith makes us believe that. We believe that every person, not one living exception, every person has sin in their lives. Every single person has brokenness. Everybody. And we believe that every single person, not one, every single person is within the grasp of God's grace. Every one of them. So whatever belief system we espouse to help us to navigate any of these issues, if we put our Christianity first, then that belief system needs to, needs to line up with, 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 with those beliefs that, that, that our, our faith is founded upon. It gives us different values. I mean, we value reconciliation, which means people coming together. 
We value forgiveness. We value facts. We value being rooted in the truth. We value these things. And we need to be navigating and thinking critically about what we believe through the lens of our faith. I mean, the reality is that the church used to be on the front lines of all of these things. I mean, we'll just use, use race as, a, as an example. I mean, think about the great spiritual heroes of the past. I, I think, think, well, not even about spiritual heroes yet. Think, think about the great heroes in uh, the movement towards racial justice in the past. I mean, think about the William Wilberforces who fought to end the transatlantic slave trade. If you're here at 930, you've talked about him before. Hey, he's a selfish guy after his own political gain until he meets Jesus. Then he gives decades of his life to ending the transatlantic slave trade. Other people participated in that. He led the charge deeply committed a Christian. Who is it that's moving slaves from slave states to free states? There are other people participating. The most famous is Harriet Tubman, who had visions from God. Go read about this. Visions from God about where she should go and where she shouldn't go. Deeply committed Christian. Who signs the Emancipation Proclamation? Lincoln, deeply committed to his faith. Who leads the civil rights charge? Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr. It is the church, the church that has been on the front lines of this, and yet somehow we over the last few decades have kind of taken a step back and let other people lead to our and to our country's detriment. We need to not be turtles sinking in and not doing anything. We need to not be parrots just repeating what everybody else is saying. We need to be thinking critically about everything from race to coronavirus to the presidential election to everything else. We need to think critically about these issues through the lens of our faith. That does not tell you what I think about who you should be listening to but how you should determine who you're listening to. Proximity, wisdom, belief in Jesus. I'm going to wrap up with a quote that I just love, that I just think is is such a charge uh, for, for us today. It comes from Dallas Willard. He wrote this in the late 90s, um, but it speaks more uh, true today than I think that it did then. It's this. The world can no longer be left to mere diplomats, politicians, and business leaders. They've done the best they could, no doubt. There's nothing wrong with the politicians and the business leaders, the diplomats. There's nothing wrong with the celebrities. There's nothing wrong with with, with that. But here's the thing. We, We can't trust them to be the ones that move the ball forward with everything. And we can't trust them to be the ones that tell us what to believe about all these things. This is what Willard says. It's so true. But this is an age for spiritual heroes, a time for men and women to be heroic in their faith and in spiritual character and in power. This is a time for spiritual heroes. People like those people that I mentioned before. People like that your, your, maybe your, your grandparents, or people in their generation that, that maybe the world doesn't know about that you know about. This is a time where we need men and women who are driven by their love for Jesus and by their love for other people. It's a time for those people to rise up and to lead. And those are the voices, friends, that we've got to have our ear attuned to to help us to think critically. And what else? To love generously. That's what we want, friends. We want to be men and women. We want to be teenagers and we want to be kids. We want to be Christians, followers of Jesus, who think about things critically, who take the time not just to read tweets and read headlines, but who read full articles and who read books, and who listen to people that are close to the problem, people who are wise and people who are faithful. We want to be men and women, Christians, who are thinking critically about these issues, taking time to do that, and people who are loving generously who love everyone, even when it it, it, it is sacrificial on our part. Those two things are not opposed to each other. To think critically and even love those with whom we disagree. Think critically. Love generously. And be really careful with who it is that you are giving authority to help you think through these issues. 
is my, my, my thoughts on this. It's the spiritual heroes that we need to be listening to. That's who we need to be listening to. The spiritual heroes of the past, like, like, like the Apostle Paul, who, uh, who wrote much of the New Testament. If you want to know what he thinks about race, I preached a sermon on what he thinks about slavery um, right before quarantine. You can go back and look at that. Hey, he's a spiritual hero in, in matters of race. Hey, we, we need to listen to historic figures like Paul, but then others that are more recent to us. And we need to listen to those people in our lives that are close. They're not famous, that are close, that are wise, and that are filled with the Spirit. We need to listen to those spiritual heroes. And if we listen to them, you might just find yourself at a place one day where you, like Willard is suggesting, where you could do something spiritually heroic. But it starts, it starts with being rooted in conversation and learning from those spiritual heroes that came before us in the scripture and in conversation and in learning. So who, friends, are you listening to? Who are you giving authority to speak into your life? Listen to those spiritual heroes, and you might just have a moment where you can do something heroic yourself. But that's where it starts. Let me pray for us. God, thanks for this time that we've had together. Thank you that your scripture still speaks to us today powerfully. It moves What you are doing in this world matters, and we want to be a part of it. And you're working through everybody, Lord. But we in particular want to have our our eyes open to and our ears attuned to those people that are close, to those people that are wise, and those people that are following after you. If if there's a, a man or a woman, a teenager or a kid who's sitting out there saying, I don't know who that is, Lord, make it clear to them, maybe even today, who that is. Help them to cross paths with somebody that can guide them. Help them to find that person. And Lord, for anybody who's tempted to be a turtle, help them to come out and and to listen to voices that maybe they disagree with, but they can help sharpen them. And for those that that are tempted to be parents, Lord, help them to think before they retweet, do I really believe this? Does this really congrue with what I believe as a follower of Jesus? God, we love you. And we thank you for your love for us. Uh, We are just so uh, grateful that we get to be a part of your work in the world. And Lord, you know, I don't know that any of us are going to be spiritual heroes like the people we talked to before, but I know that there are men and women, teenagers and kids that are are part of this today, that you are going to call to do something heroic. Maybe maybe it's quiet that nobody will ever know about, but that they're called to do that. Prepare them and help them to be bold. Help them to love you and love others well. I pray that's true for all of us in the church. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's been great to worship with you this morning. Just as a reminder, if you or somebody you love is struggling with addiction, we are here for you. You can learn more at hpumc.org slash recovery. Several weeks ago, Paul sent out a video invite to a big event we were going to host on July 5th in the Ford Stadium over at SMU. We want you to know that this event is being postponed, rescheduled for a later date. You'll receive more information by email in the weeks ahead. So keep your eyes peeled. As always, if you wanna partner with us financially, you can give at hpumc.org slash give or text any amount to the number that's listed on your screen. But before you press off or leave or go about your day, will you receive this benediction? May the Holy Spirit fill you and guide you and shake you up and send you off in the direction of peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.